Marietta Cambareri rejoices in the title Curator of Decorative Arts and Sculpture at, and Yetzgalina H. Phillips, Curator of Judaica at the Boston uh, Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, that's an interesting development and she's done wonders with the fund that the, uh, the Phillips Fund for Judaica in a, in a time when uh, many large museums don't uh, tend to do a lot about Judaica. Um, she's uh, done a lot there at Boston. I hope everybody's seen her gallery with Renaissance sculpture that includes a really interesting um, variety of, of sculptures uh, by the Della Robbia with uh, all, um, all odd, also odd pieces that really can take you in a lot of directions there in a very few yards. Um, why should I go on? We want to hear Marietta. Thank you so much, Jim, um, and thank you very much to Jim Draper and to Katya Brandt for inviting me to speak here today. It's a real honor, and um, I can only say um, my warmest thanks to Katya Brandt for um, almost everything I've ever done in this field. In 1950, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston acquired this glazed terracotta sculpture of St. John the Baptist which stands 100 centimeters tall, about 39 and a half inches. It was a gift from the collection of Mrs. Solomon R. Guggenheim, Irene Rothschild. Kept in her Port Washington, Long Island home, the sculpture arrived uh, in Boston in a very rough condition. And it seems to have gone directly into storage without being cleaned or conserved for display in the galleries. The curator at the time, Edwin J. Hipkiss, noted that the, that the statue, which was called Florentine around 1550 and attributed to the Della Robbia family, had been broken and badly repaired, but he stated, quote, its stylistic vigor and quality speak for themselves. Venturi and Marquand do not aid in, in definite identification of the sculptor, but given time, we may discover our man. Acceptance recommended, unquote. I would just note that thus far we have not been able to trace any information about when or how the piece entered the Guggenheim collection. We do know that before Solomon Guggenheim began collecting modern art, uh, the couple had collected old masters, but much of that material was sold. The sculpture, however, seems to have remained unpublished and unknown, un unknown to scholars until its recent emergence from deep, dark storage at the MFA. And here, indeed, we see the St. John up in the attic storage uh, in an undated um, archival photograph. An undated note in pencil on the accession card uh, in Hans Swartzensky's hand uh, crosses out Della Robbia family and changes the attribution to attributed to Giovanni Francesco Rustici. And uh, notes from his files related it as a type to Rustici's baptistry group. And this could have happened anywhere from about 1950 to about 1970, his, uh, Sportsetsky's attribution, it's not clear. After this, the piece seems to have garnered little attention. It was moved at some point into an even deeper and darker uh, bay of the attic, but at least was covered by a bag at some point. In November of 2004, as we were working to empty the attic in preparation for the demolition of the old east wing, to make way for the construction of the new Norman Foster Art of the Americas wing, which opened in November of 2010, the St. John appeared again, and this is how I first saw him. It was uh, in rough shape indeed, but it was also very clearly, it seemed to me, a major example of glazed terracotta sculpture of the early Cinquecento, not Della Robbia family around 1550, by which date no real Della Robbia workshop existed, uh, and so uh, one of the first questions was indeed, could it be by Rustici? But already I felt that the attribution was not even the most important thing. This sculpture was, and still seems to me, to be something of an outlier, 
something like he is in this conference. He's a bit of an outlier here. Uh, but um, surely Florentine and surely early Cinquecento. It almost didn't matter who it was by. What was clear is that we needed to study and conserve the piece and to try to understand it better in the process. And I show you four views of it before conservation. And thus began a great collaboration among curatorial conservation and research science colleagues at the MFA, which gave new life to this intriguing sculpture. And I express my deepest gratitude to and appreciation for my colleagues, Abby Hyken, objects conservator, Richard Newman, head of research science, and Michelle Derrick, research scientist. As you will see, and here you see the, the sculpture after cleaning and restoration, uh, Abby's work, supported by Richard's and Michelle's analyses and interpretation, was exemplary in every way. I'd also like to acknowledge the pioneering work in modern scholarship uh, carried out by Charles Davis. His study of Rustici's reliefs showed me early on that we probably were looking at a work by Rustici himself. By 2005, the piece was in good enough shape to travel to David Franklin's exhibition, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and the Renaissance in Florence at the National Gallery in Canada, of Canada in Ottawa, where I cataloged it as attributed to John Francesco Rustici and uh, dated around 1510 to 20. It was hailed as a major rediscovery, and the attribution was generally accepted and endorsed. In 2007, the St. John was featured in an exhibition at the MFA, Donatello to John Bologna, uh, Italian Renaissance sculpture at the MFA Boston, which presented a reevaluation of, of our Renaissance sculpture collection with many pieces emerging from the storerooms, newly conserved and studied. St. John's story was told in a feature by Miles Unger in the New York Times in February of 2007, making my mother very proud. And um, in quick succession, Three monographs were published on Rustici in French, Italian, and German, respectively by um, Philippe Seneschal in 2007, by, to, by Tommaso Mazzati in 2008, and by Martina Minning in 2010. All accepted the attribution, though there was and still remains some disagreement as to the date of the piece, ranging from about 1505 to about 1515 to 20. In 2010, the piece went home to Florence for the exhibition at the Bargello, I, Gron I Grandi Bronzi del Battistero, Rustici e Leonardo. And upon its return to Boston, we uh, reinstalled him in uh, its most recent and current setting. Um, and at that point, I dropped the qualifying attributed to, and I now present it as Rustici. Sort of like Jim was saying, you get the chance to reevaluate your attributions as you get to reinstall your sculptures. And it is an attribution that I now firmly believe in. I would also note that in, a recent, uh, in the recent Renaissance Society of America con um, conference, Benjamin Binstock put forth the idea that the Boston St. John is by Leonardo. So, quite a journey for this sculpture. I would have been very content for him to take a little rest as he settles into his newfound fame. So when I was asked to present on the piece for this conference, I was a little confused as to how our St. John would fit in and what the role the sculpture might play here. I supposed that I might consider whether the piece might date a bit earlier than I've, I tend to date it, which I've modified to about 1505 to 1515, uh, or at least very early in that range. Rustici's life dates are uh, 1474 to 1554, so in the 1490s, he was a young man in his 20s, uh, and this was surely a formative decade for him. At the Bargello, he was displayed on a wall with a painting of St. John the Baptist by Filippino Lippi, which dates to the late 1490s. And another glazed terracotta attributed to Rustici, the Rape of Europa at the Victoria and Albert, which is related to a drawing by Filippino in the Uffizi. So the sculpture was presented as looking back to um, and representing Rustici's late Quattrocento roots. 
Across the room was displayed his, uh, the large altarpiece of the Nole Me Tangere, Rusticci's major work in the glazed terracotta medium, described by Vasari as modeled by Rusticci and glazed by Giovanni della Robbia, made for the nuns of the convent of San Luca in Via San Gallo in Florence. I would note that there is also disagreement over the dating of this altarpiece. Uh, there are those who dated around 1510, and there are those who dated around 1520. And I will just say right now, any date that I say right now, people argue with. I have no firm dates in this talk, so I, that's part of the story. The relationship of the Boston St. John to Filipino, who died in 1504, has been noted before uh, uh, by Mozzati and remarked upon by others. And it's surely there, especially in the slender, elongated proportions of the figure, his wiry emotionalism, and even vaguely the position of his arms. And yet I felt, and I expect that there are those uh, here in the audience who do not agree with me, that the installation clarified the issue, that while the Boston St. John does have the very slender, wiry proportions of a work like Filipinos, and certainly responds to the model, I believe we are looking at a figure from a very different moment. If we compare it to the pathos and deep interior emotion of Filipino St. John, we see a very different kind of energy at work. If we contrast this St. John to the calmer, more elegiac figures associated with the master of St. John and David statuettes, which also date somewhere vaguely in the early Cinquecento, uh, this is in Cleveland, and it's dated on their website as about 1500 to 1525, the energized, expressive aspects of the Boston St. John come through. This figure is so tightly wound up, it's not at all relaxed, but focused, energized, and ready to deliver his message with sharply focused eyes and, and open speaking lips. It is indeed very similar to the tightly wound energy of the, of the figures of Rustici's great preaching of the Baptist, which is the true point of reference for this, the Boston St. John made for over the north portal of Florence Baptistry between 1506 and 1511. Furthermore, the direct comparison with the Bronze Baptist seems to me to be ever stronger since the conservation of the group. The chiaroscuro effects of the figure, the animation of the space around him, and the tight energy of the pose seem to me to be all the more closely linked to the great baptistry group. I remember seeing the bronzes for the first time after their conservation, which was completed in 2009, in an installation in the Baptistry in Florence. But I show you here the installation of Gary Radke's show, uh, Leonardo and the Art of Sculpture, at the High Museum in Atlanta. And, ex and especially when contemplating the head of the, um, the bronze St. John, thinking for the first time, well, yes, I really do think this is by the same sculptor as our, our St. John. I am particularly struck by the similarity in approach to the, um, to the emphasis on light and shade in these, in these heads, the curls, the mouth, the chiaroscuro effect uh, is something I would like to return to later on. So yes, I believe that the Boston St. John is by Rustici. But even after three monographs and two shows in the last five years, Rustici's art remains difficult to pin down clearly especially in issues of attribution and chronology. Do I believe that these works were made by the same artist? Yes, I do. Does that help us to date the Boston St. John? Not at all. The elements that can be most easily noted are the sculpture's relationship to Donatello. And of course, Rustici was one of the principal artists involved in a kind of Donatello uh, revival in the years around 1500. Uh, and Michelangelo, of course, was another. I show a terracotta relief of the Magdalene, also in the MFA's collection, which, like our St. John, reflects Donatello's wood sculpture of the Magdalene and likely dates to the 1490s. It's known in several versions, including one at the Victoria and Albert in London. This seems to me the kind of object that a sculptor like Rustici might produce in the 1490s, and indeed, Rustici's name has been proposed to me verbally for this, uh, for this relief as well. Here, too, the St. John seems very, very different. And like Donatello, we can't tie Rustici down to a strict linear chronology. 
I would not be completely surprised to discover that the piece dated to any moment in his career. However, I would be more surprised if that date was in the 1490s or even in the years close around 1500. If the piece does date to that early period, it would truly be a harbinger of a new age, like the saint he represents, the last prophet of an old era, the first of a new age. As I have argued elsewhere, I believe that technical aspects of the piece relate back to methods shaped in Verrocchio's workshop and passed on to artists like Lorenzo de Credi, Leonardo da Vinci, and ultimately Rustici himself. So I'd like to spend the rest of my time uh, looking closely at the piece, including a review of the conservation process, and I will share with you some of the ways that the technical work fed ideas and provided answers about certain aspects of the sculpture. And first I show you several views of um, the piece which can give you just an idea of just how damaged and dirty it was. And I would say that these technical aspects are for me um, the, the way the piece really asserts its quattrocento roots. We tried to do everything possible that we could technically to gain as full a picture of the piece as possible. Thermal luminescence testing, for what that's worth, uh, gave us a range of dates of 1551 plus or minus 50 years, so firmly in the 16th century. Under UV light, you can see areas of uh, overpaint and restoration, which cover breaks. There's a, there are breaks in the torso, uh, a, a break in the neck, some breaks were in the, uh, in the arms. You can see that the hoof was a restoration as well. Overall, the glaze was in fantastic condition. These breaks at the hands, to me, have been uh, especially interesting uh, because it, um, it seems to me that the terracotta snapped at places where Rustici likely was working and reworking the clay, uh, creating weaker joins in the clay and um, in the wet clay, which then were susceptible to breaking after firing. And these kinds of disembodied moments in the restoration process uh, reminded me very much of Leonardo's famous hand studies, which focus on the positions and uh, gestures, which are, of course, so important for the expressive aspects of the figures, of the figure. And um, I should just show you a couple of views of the hand after restoration. You can see this in the left arm as well, and I show you here, this is perhaps St. John at his worst, with some of the restorations removed, but you can see it snapped at this hand as well. Um, and um, these, these details of the head uh, before restoration and then in the midst of conservation, uh, you can see that there were major breaks in the neck as well, and I believe that this is uh, Rustici really working out the very subtle and expressive turn and tilt of the head, which is again so important in conveying his character and emotion. And I again would suggest that he worked and reworked the clay, uh, the wet clay, creating less stable joins, more susceptible to breaking. The pointing finger is a restoration. You can see the old um, plaster repair. And this detail, combined with the crossing of the arm over the chest and with the strong uh, turn of the head against the shoulder, uh, this is a gesture being explored by uh, both Leonardo and Andrea del Sarto. Again, I'm not gonna try to date this. Uh, the uh, Worcester uh, uh, St. John by, uh, by Sarto is generally dated to around 1517. I don't believe that it was ever a kind of self-referential gesture, uh, as we see in this, uh, in this uh, sweet little sculpture that, uh, whose presence, present whereabouts uh, uh, I don't know. If anyone does, let me know. It was in the Ambar collection in the early years of the 20th century. I'm convinced by the anatomy of the hand and by the curling of these other three fingers that this, uh, uh, that this restoration is correct. And of course, it is completely reversible should some future curator disagree with our decision to repair it, to restore it. Uh, X-radiography confirms the areas of breakage that I I've told you about uh, and shows repairs that are, uh, are filled with, uh, there's plaster and uh, bolts and pins. Um, and I would just say a special word of thanks to Giancarlo Gentilini for many aspects of our work on this St. John but especially for having helped us see um, 
uh, the technique so clearly in these x-rays. So you have the legs which are uh, quite solid, and then as you work up the torso, you can literally see Rustici working these, sort of wrapping these uh, kind of sausages of clay, as Abby likes to call them, uh, as he uh, modeled the, uh, the figure. And the kind of softness of the interior contour suggests that the core was made of soft rags, which uh, then could be pulled out from small, two small holes at the back of the sculpture. Um, the density that you see here and the bolt, uh, that is actually plaster fill and a bolt holding it together at the join. Uh, here's a pin holding the neck, but you can see that a, another nail has, has fallen into the hollow head, probably once uh, held a halo. And you even get a sense of how the drapery, uh, which really does have a life of its own, is being applied uh, as he's working the clay. Uh, this detail of a piece of drapery not well adhered gives you a sense of those sort of rolls of clay. And on the piece that came off, we had, a, we had a, this beautiful fingerprint, which is, of course, always a thrill to see uh, in clay. Uh, elsewhere, um, it, it becomes clear that the drapery actually seems to have been applied over the modeled flesh. So he's working the drapery and then applying it. Uh, and this detail also shows you um, how we came upon our other major restoration to the, um, to the sculpture. This is the, um, the old repair of a hoof. And when Abby took it off, we could tell exactly how far the glaze had traveled. And we had this beautiful little indentation that told us just where the, uh, the hoof needed to touch uh, the, um, the goat skin. And uh, here, just to give you another sense of, really had that sense of how the drapery is applied over uh, the modeled figure. And then I show you uh, Abby's beautiful and perfectly fitting and much more naturalistic new hoof. The overall handling and independence of the drapery reminded me of drapery studies like this one by Leonardo, which developed out of techniques already being used in Verrocchio's shop in the 1470s. And I'd also like to turn, return now to the idea of chiaroscuro and the use of color in this figure, which is also exemplified by the comparison with this drapery study, where light and shade are so carefully worked out. In my work on this sculpture, I have stressed the color of the glaze and the experimental quality that it displays. It's not the brilliant white of Della Robbia glazes, but it is a creamier white, uh, which absorbs light uh, more than the brilliant reflective light of uh, the Della Robbia's. And I just show you a comparison with the MFA's Madonna of the Niche, uh, another uh, version of which is here at the Met. And I pressed our research scientists on this. And the analysis of the glaze does, in fact, indicate a higher percentage of copper uh, than in any other results that uh, we have for Della Robbia or Bullioni Whites studied at the MFA. And we tested the glazes on all of our glazed terracottas. Uh, and other glaze analyses that have been carried out and published elsewhere. So I would argue that, what, that Rustici was actually pushing the limits of glaze formulas in order to achieve the softer color. I also asked if the strange degradation of the glaze that you see on the base of the sculpture could have been uh, the result of a less than perfect glaze technique. But Abby and Richard put their collective foot down on this. They do not believe that's the case. They believe that the fracturing and discoloration of the glaze really resulted from deposits of soot and dirt and moisture on the piece. And you can see this little drip, where some kind of little waxy drip of some sort protected the glaze from this, de this degradation. And of course, the piece was kept in a um, Long Island residence for a long time. And Abby actually found uh, a wasp's nest tucked up between his legs. So its environment was not always the best. But I continue to believe that the high copper content indicates the, uh, the artist's deliberate seeking of a creamier color, which would emphasize the chiaros chiaroscuro effects in ways that brilliant reflective light white would mitigate. And I believe that this leads us through another door, which is indicated here by another glazed terracotta St. John by Benedetto Buglioni, over the portal to the oratory of the Scalzo in Florence. And my concluding point today is to stress the consonance of Rustici's St. John with the remarkable achievements of Andrea del Sarto in the Chiostro dello Scalzo 
frescoes. For me, it is, uh, in fact, not so much Filipino Lippi, who is the St. John's painterly kindred spirit, but Andrea del Sarto, who, uh, as Vasari tells us, was a great friend to the sculptor. And I show you um, the baptism uh, in, the, in the scalzo. Chiaroscuro effects characterize both the St. John and Sarto's frescoes. And here, what is generally considered the earliest scene in the program, the baptism of Christ, it dates before 1515, but beyond that, nobody agrees on these dates either. Uh, but I show you a comparison between the St. John's, and there too you have that elongation of form and um, sort of relatively wiry proportions in the uh, sarto. And the tightness of the pose. I think, you know, when we're talking about the Cupid with their, his, his feet uh, so close together, you see that here as well, and that kind of a stretching of the forms. And uh, now I show you the, uh, the preaching of the Baptist, which is generally dated to around 1515. Again, not a lot of agreement on dates for the, for the, for the Scalzo frescoes. So both of these, uh, these works might be seen as developments or translations of, um, of Leonardo's ideas about chiaroscuro modeling into different media. Might they even be related? Vasari describes the chiaroscuro technique as using terretta, the kind of clay that potters use as a foundation color. And on the St. John, it's hard to see in the slides, but there are areas where the glaze is so thin that you see the, 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 the clay coming through. So uh, you use the clay as the foundation color, and then it is highlighted with ground travertine, and shadows are created with ground charcoal or other black. It's an intriguing confluence of ideas. So I believe that Rustici sought in the St. John a kind of chiaroscuro effect with a glaze that does not create a glassy reflective surface, but a kind of penumbra on the surface of the sculpture, and crea which creates a truly innovative animation of the surface in this very particular and quite restrictive medium. And in so doing, he displays a remarkable sense of, of experimentation and ambition. And I just would run a couple of slides with the heads of the, of the Sarto, the Rustici, the Filipino. I choose that as the comparison. And for me, um, the best comparisons come even later in the work of Sarto, where his paintings um, demonstrate the effects of using a Leonardesque chiaroscuro modeling under the application of color and an energized surface, and where a similar intensity of gaze and extremely subtle positioning of the heads on the necks are used to such great effect. And I show you his portrait of a man in the National Gallery, London, and the Disputation on the Trinity in Palazzo Pitti, and just a couple of details. And both of these paintings uh, seem to date to the late teens. And here, I may be pushing too far, so I'll stop. Uh, but I can't help but seeing the Boston St. John as a truly forward-looking sculpture, even if we were to date it closer to 1515 or just after. Like the work of Donatello, uh, the Boston St. John seems to speak his own particular language, which is tied up with ideas of expressive and engaging energies, tightly wound and deeply expressive poses, and highly ambitious experimentation within a fairly restrictive medium of glazed terracotta. He is an outlier, as I said at the beginning of the paper. And again, while I would not be completely surprised to find out that the John might date to any period in Rustici's career, he seems to me to stand with his feet firmly pl placed in the 16th century, not merely a prophet of a new age, but an agent and a player in that age. Thank you.